late and it's an appropriate time to make some frog music. So as you see, frogs are very musical creatures and uh, each species has its own song but only the male frogs sing. So you would be thinking if only the males, male frogs are singing it has got to something to do with territoriality and sex. And you are right. Uh, the sex, uh, sex has been identified as a strong driver of evolution of these species. It's, it forms species through time and space. Ancestors of frogs crawled out of uh, water and one of the biggest problems that they faced was laying their eggs in a very desiccating sort of environment. We don't know the solutions that these creatures might have come up with. But evolution has a way of repeating itself. We can use this feature of evolution to figure out what they, these creatures might have done a long time back. Not only that, we can also, after we understand the processes of evolution, we also can predict what the current species will do in different climatic, ecological, and habitat scenarios in the future. Frogs laying eggs in water sometimes have it very difficult because water in water, the oxygen con concentration can go down, it, the puddles can get dried out, there could be swarms of predators like birds, and also the developmental rate of eggs in water uh, can be uh, very slow. So to counter these problems, frogs have come up with many different strategies. Our lab studies frog evolution, and we have been studying for the last 15 years the old world tree frogs, or Rakaforidae. Old world tree frogs trace their origins back in time to the Cretaceous tertiary extinction event when the dinosaurs went extinct. And the old world tree frogs also have, have a Asian distribution. So we were talking about reproductive modes and what about the reproductive modes? What sort of reproductive modes do these Asian tree frogs have? And uh, one of the major reproductive modes that they have is terrestrial direct development. And we have been studying this for about 10 years now and the sex acts that these frogs do have not been witnessed by many. So let me share with you terrestrial direct de development in these shrub frogs. So initially the male calls, initially the male calls and the female approaches this male and the female evaluates the male by uh, listening to this call and the female evaluates the size of the male, the age of the male and how uh, large it is. Then the female approaches the male and they come into this hold called the amplexus. Basically the male becomes a backpack for the female. Uh, very useful, but a burden for her also because she has to carry this backpack on her back around uh, the forest floor. So she climbs down into the forest floor and does something really surprising that frogs usually don't do. She starts digging a hole in the ground. She rotates while digging and almost dig a hole to large enough to engulf them both. And the female lays eggs and the male fertilizes them.
And then the male leaves and she goes on caring for these eggs. She mixes the eggs with uh, soil and then starts covering the eggs with soil and then she also leaves. Okay. These yolk-filled eggs undergo a remarkable transformation. Without hatching out as tadpoles, the embryos stay within the egg and starts development within this egg and finally a froglet jumps out and this is terrestrial direct development. And there's another group of frogs in Sri Lanka uh, that do it, do this a little bit differently. The couple lay their eggs under a leaf and the female cares for the eggs and you see again terrestrial direct development. You can see inside the eggs little froglets developing. They have bypassed the uh, tadpole stage completely. This is really beneficial for these frogs because now they can roam the forest land and uh, adapt to local climatic conditions. So when this happens, these populations that adapt to local climatic conditions can eventually become new species. And this is what you see in direct developers. You see like 189 species. You see hundreds of new species also. And we, we and people in India and Southeast Asia have been describing these uh, new frogs. So lots of frogs. And their distribution is Sri Lanka, India, and Southeast Asia. Then the next developmental mode is form nesting. In this, the female finds a suitable spot overhanging water and all the liqui uh, liquids that exudes out of her oviduct is beaten up into a frothy mass. And inside this frothy mass, the eggs are laid. And the, there's an outer crust and inside it's like very wet. The tadpoles develop within this frothy mass and then fall down into water as tadpoles to undergo further development. And this is form nesting. And these are some of the tadpoles of the form nesting frogs. Okay, they look like normal tadpoles. So form nesters have the widest distribution. Form, nest me, form nesting makes them have really large distributions. Some of them, some of these frogs have even gone to Africa. Okay, and uh, it is also a species-rich group. When you distribute wide also, you can have a lot of species. And the next uh, reproductive mo mode is gel nesting. And gel nesters lay their eggs in a jelly mass. And the tadpoles again fall into water to undergo further development. And uh, in gel nesters, there's another slightly different mode where they lay their eggs in tree holes. Tadpoles again fall into water. Okay, and if you take the distribution of gel nesters, they don't have a very wide distribution, only 54 species, uh, only in Southeast Asia. And finally, the fourth reproductive mode is aquatic breeding. In this, these frogs uh, basically lay their eggs in water, streams, and the tadpoles come out. This is the normal or the typical uh, mode of reproduction that you all are familiar with. And when you look at the spread of this distribution, they are confined to the periphery of the Rakafarid uh, distribution and there are only 10 species. Okay. So to evaluate how, uh, which of these reproductive modes come first, uh, are there any transit transitory states uh, are there any benefits that you can have by having these reproductive modes and uh, the timing of these reproductive modes? At which, uh, at which time in the history of life did they come into being? To ask such questions, you have to look at frog DNA. DNA, as you know, unites all life. 
and there's a single root uh, in the tree of life 3.5 billion years ago. So all the changes that ha has happened since that uh, beginning 3.5 billion years ago uh, is written into DNA. DNA has a signature of history. You can unravel that history, especially in shallow time, it really works. So what we did was we got as many as species possible from the racophorids in the region, and, uh, and they represent all these four reproductive modes, and summarized all that DNA data. And this is what the summarization looked like. Uh, it's called a phylogenetic tree. It shows the ancestor-descendant relationships, it shows the primitive species and the advanced species or the derived species, and when you look at terrestrial direct development in green, uh, you see three instance of, instances of uh, direct development evolving, at least two instances of origin of direct development, and uh, the next one is form nesting. Form nesters are also in two groups, uh, this large group and this chiromantis, a group that has gone to Africa, as we discussed. So again, two origins of form nesting and uh, gel nesting. Several origins of gel nesting. And the aquatic breeders. Aquatic breeders are down here on the phylogenetic tree. Those are the most primitive uh, forms. Okay. And this is the uh, timing of this event. And the aquatic breeders have evolved about 66 million years ago. And the gel nest was 42 million years ago. And you can see that terrestrial direct de developers have evolved about 42. And polypidate is about 40 million years ago. So. Can 65 million years of sex evolution save these tree frogs? This is a big question. We are currently undergoing the six mass extinction event, and we are destroying habitats, and frogs have been identified as environmentally sensitive organisms. They're actually called uh, organisms indicative of environmental degradation. And uh, the IUCN, or the World Conservation Union, uh, evaluates all the species as to how probable they are going to go extinct. So in, in this evaluation, being critically endangered is the worst thing uh, that can happen for a species. So uh, when you look at uh, the critically endangered species, this is what you see. Uh, in direct developers, you see 21 species uh, out of the 189, highly prone to go extinct. And of the form nesting species, just two species. In these two developmental modes, gel nesting and aquatic breeding, you don't see any critically endangered species. What about the extinct species? From Sri Lanka itself, 18 species of direct developers have gone extinct already. So. Uh, a solution that worked historically, which evolution refined for a very long period of time, uh, is not working anymore because the change that the human species is doing is too rapid for evolution to keep up with. So, epitomized in humans, perhaps human selfishness can never be controlled, and Richard Dawkins talks about the selfish gene uh, he says selfish gene controls uh, itself and propagates through life using various organisms as vehicles and generating and disseminating the knowledge is perhaps the only way to create organisms uh, to care for the organisms that, that share uh, this world with us. So we'll end with the frog song again. This is a highly uh, 
critically endangered species that you find in the Horton Plains in Sri Lanka. And thank you very much.